So Patrick walked in here saying we should give 30 seconds thought to what we should talk about before. And I said, no, this, this is that 30 seconds. <laughs> this is that 30 seconds. Welcome. Who knows? Maybe we're going to have seconds. our first, maybe we're going to have our first, like, um, what's the, what's this speaking equivalent of writer's block? Um, I, don't I know. can't say. I think between the two of us, we always have something to say. That maybe that's the problem. Yeah. Maybe we do a 50 minute silent meditation. Um, for those of you who are listening, one thing we've been trying to figure turn out. Turn me down a tiny bit, sorry. On it's your, very on loud. Your yeah. Yeah, how's that? For those of you who have been our loyal listeners, there seems to be a few dozen of you out there. <laughs> and we're very, very happy. Uh, with seven, all the comments, seven. the encouragement, and all of that. But we need some help getting the word out there about this podcast. So if you have any ideas or you want to help and get on, on board the being in the world uh, little team that we are assembling even here in the desert, <laughs> um, you know, do, do you think Instagram ads are useful? Do you think YouTube ads are useful? Do you think um, you could help us post on different blogs? Would you help us get some guests? Do you like it better when we have guests or do you like it better when we're just the two of us? We need feedback uh, because we're really making this up as we go along. So, And we really like emails. I really like emails. Oh, I check my email like once a week. Oh, okay. <laughs> Send me an email. <laughs> What's your email, Patrick? Uh, House.k.patrick at gmail.com. Fucking love emails. Also, just anything. Just talk to me. We've never edited any of the podcasts. Um, um, my friend just uh, who's an editor just told me that she uh, so has a job editing a podcast where she cuts all the ums and the uhs out. What? Why? Disfluencies are like key to uh, communication and language and understanding what someone is intending. What? Well, how so? Because I mean, they're, they're not random. They're not accidental. You use them to like, in, uh, in, you're using them to so signal you're... that you're not done with your sentence. You're using them to signal that it's not your turn to talk. The conch shell is mine still. I played this game once with friends where we sat around a table and we had a bunch of sugar packets and in the center was a bowl. And every time any one of us said, um, like as, or disflu any disfluency whatsoever, we had to toss one of our packets into the bowl. And it is remarkable how often you do it. Like There like are people that are better at it than others. There are, there absolutely are. And, and, and we do want to, like, I do think this has... I like my mother listened the other day mm -hmm. to a bunch of them and she called me with feedback mm -hmm. and she said, you know, the way Patrick speaks is so great. He really s slow and he considers what he's about to say. And <laughs> you seem to speak a little too fast. And you also uh, cover up your, you know, say ums and likes when they're not necessary. You could just pause and just think. And um, so I, but I also think that our different levels of energy are probably a good thing. Yeah. We have circadian mismatches. If we did this at like between the hours of 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., I'd be talking fast. <laughs> and I would be asleep. You'd be asleep. Yeah, I'd exactly. be literally asleep. It's freaking 7 in the morning. But I'm, I'm, I'm down to try that too. Yeah, yeah. We totally could. You could just like wake me up. and. <laughs> so the time zone in which I think I, I fit. So I, I think I was born like two hours off the East Coast uh, into the Atlantic. That's my approximate. Uh, that's my approximation for where my circadian peak is. So I, cause I don't, I don't sleep well, but I do like, as I get closer and closer to the East coast and then it's still not perfect, but I, I think it's almost like sea turtle like where I think I was born there and my body knows that I was born on some Island off the East coast of the Atlantic. And like, I'm just locked circadian to that time zone. Um, and, and yeah, this is, this California stuff is not working for me. Yeah. I can, I only function between like 6am and 10am is my productive time where I can, practice the piano in a focused way, do this podcast, be at my peak eloquence, I think, and thought, and then the rest of the day is just fucked for me. Yeah. So I, so back on the, the disfluency thing, I, my, my, uh, PhD advisor, Robert Sapolsky is extremely exquisitely articulate. And I noticed at some point he never uses disfluencies or very, very rarely does. And I thought it was some sort of like practice like he's the tiger woods of speaking his father was a lecturer as well and he used to sit at when he was like three years old like tiger woods used to you know put on a putting green um he used to sit in his father's lectures and just listen and so i just assumed it was some like maybe maybe even like trained or learned just like he's 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 just the tiger woods of speaking and and it cannot be learned and you cannot mimic it but then i realized that he does use disfluencies and i noticed this more and more and more with people and it's this conversational trick where instead of 
pausing or saying um or like or as they just repeat certain phrases from the oh, previous sentence interesting. and so they're doing it they're doing exactly the same functional thing but they've just figured out a way to kind of mask it with something that sounds a little bit more articulate can you actually think of an example uh, i'll do it like 20 times for in, the, in the rest of this podcast wow and and then so i'll tell you at the end of the podcast where i did it i read that as intelligence goes up the disfluencies go down but only to a point. And if they go away completely, it means the person's not actually thinking about what they're saying and they're just pra saying something practiced. So you want a few of them, to, but you don't want so many that it's a distraction. And yeah. there are people, there are nervous tics. Like there's people who laugh after everything they say because they're insecure about what they're saying. I do think that there are s skills that we need to practice. And I think that as we're doing this, I do think we're going to get better at it. At least I hope so, because I I do admire the skill of speaking so much. Yeah, you know? absolutely, like, absolutely. I just think it's just like just it's a beautiful art form, and I see it as 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 compelling and as as exhilarating as music to me. Yeah, rhetoric classes in college have become like uh, analyzing fashion ads instead of the ancient Roman like art of rhetoric. And uh, so so back to the back to that that table I was sitting around with my friends, right? So sitting around this table with my friends and and we did a thing where we tried different personal see what i did there yep, personal I, uh, stories and i worry that you're going to be self-consciously doing that instead of thinking about what you're saying because you've already promised that you're going to do it 20 times well so 20 is a lot your mind is going to take up it's like, like once taken every up other that. minute you know it's kind of a lot um and but so the thing we did is we the the, the test the experimental condition was we tried to tell different kinds of stories and you, the rate of disfluencies goes up massively if you're telling a personal story, Ooh, yeah, I bet right? That. Versus a scientific story. So it was just like the three of us and we were just like, okay, now tell a scientific story that hasn't happened to you or a personal story that has happened to you or tell a joke or tell, and, and the kind of storytelling device, it's probably, a, it's probably built in us to a certain kind of, if you're being vulnerable, you use more just kind of to like keep attention or there's definitely stylistic ticks. Or also you're just genuinely nervous. I yeah, noticed yesterday yeah, when absolutely. I was talking about my dream, I would definitely felt less fluent than I wanted to be. And I could feel being a little bit nervous about, well, how much should I be revealing about right. my subconscious to these strangers? I mean, so far you're probably mostly our friends listening, but like eventually it'll be strangers. And I'll, and I find that in podcasts, like you, it's a fine balance between somebody being exhibitionistic uh, for the sake of that or for the sake of narcissism versus just being honest and real and uh, versus being purely academic and not revealing anything. And it's just like this, this little dance that we have to figure out. Right. We got a third request for an, uh, an episode on narcissism. And this one was straight to my face. Someone was saying like, Oh, two, two men talking about astrology who don't believe in astrology. Yeah. That's fun to listen to. How about you talk about narcissism, bitch? <laughs> you could, you could take a wild guess who said that. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a good idea. We might as well talk about narcissism. Like <laughs> it is the kind of like kind of uh, disease of our age. I think there's things that that kind of like nurture narcissism, right? Of course, there's people who are like <clears throat> pathologically narcissistic from, you know, they just have it as a <clears throat> as their personal problem. But I do think this age, if you have a narcissist, like latent narcissistic tendencies, there are going to be things that kind of tease them out in ways that would never have happened before. Right. I mean, we take it for granted even that mirrors are everywhere. But of course, like in the in the old days, like a mirror was a very special, expensive, rare object for people to have. Right. What's your what's your relationship with mirrors? Do you have one? Do you think about them as objects? I'll, I'll say this for two reasons. One, yeah. uh, the the passage I read uh, about the, the elegance passage about the rage room, there's a therapist there and the, her favorite object to smash was a mirror. And she said that was, I mean, that, that gave her the most pleasure in part because it's like, it was, there's no such thing as a mirror that's not about her. So it was kind of also, she thought a cathartic, like uh, it, it was just her favorite. And it was obviously psychologically fraught for her. And I went in like, high school this is very personal detail i'll probably use some disfluencies um i went like a year in high school without looking mirrors i was very self-conscious i used to shave in the dark i used to i used to not turn uh lights on in the bathroom because you, were, you didn't like seeing yourself yeah i didn't like it i hated it i hated it, hated it, hated it. Uh, like like uh people always tell me that i'm not from where i'm from they're always like where are you from what is your ethnicity what is your background uh like if i smile a certain way people are like do you have chinese eyes you have some sort of asian eyes they're kind of squinty People are 
saying like, like they just can't place me. And uh-huh. I thought I was kind of some alien hybrid creature from, from nowhere. I don't know. It was, I mean, hormones. I know? wonder if this is partly your beard also like wanting to cover up your face. Oh, to hide. Oh yeah. Well, my hair much more so. My hair is hiding. People notice my hair so they don't notice me. I yeah, always, you... I always have some distractor cue like a magician. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, look over here. Look over here. Yeah. And would you consider doing the hair and the beard? So no, I've done it before. Done. It's too much. Can't, it's too... Yeah. <laughs> it becomes... just too much. Yeah. <laughs> It, be- it becomes mane like it's sub-Saharan African in, in, its, yeah, yeah. in its qualities. Um, wait, so uh, narcissism. So do you, <laughs> do you have a take on narcissism as a as a scientist, as a as a neuroscientist? Uh, the only thing I think about is, um, I mean, so I mean, I think it's funny that like there's this ancient Greek myth that is deeply about ego and personhood, and I th- still think about parasites. I just can't not think about parasites. So the original myth, right? He's looking into a reflection in the lake. Yep. And uh, narcissus. Yeah. And um, I, I just I just think one of the greatest stories in the last few generations of biology. Uh, so there's a there's a, a worm that gets inside crickets. It makes them jump into the water and commit suicide. Right. It's a parasite. And for some reason, these crickets they get to the edge of this body of water, and they'll jump into pools and they'll jump into lakes and they'll just kill themselves. There's a great movie uh, from Korea called Deranged, which is about this, where people end up with a personalized version of this, and they also end up jumping into the water. The point being, people wanted to figure out, scientists wanted to figure out how and why is it doing this? Like, why are these crickets jumping into water? doesn't make any sense. And then once they jump into water, the parasite comes out of their body, right? The cricket drowns, and then the parasite explodes out of their body, and that's the parasitic life cycle. And so I, having also studied parasitic life cycles, was fascinated by this. Because we're all trying to figure out the like mystery of how these parasites manipulate their hosts, and they they tried everything. They looked looked in the labs. They made little tubs of water at night. You know, like they tried to recreate the conditions, and these crickets just weren't jumping into the water in the lab. And and I mean, it it, it seemed like just just this tragedy. Like these crickets would you just watch a video of them and they'd pause at the edge of the water and they'd just like stare at it as if they were staring into the abyss, and then suddenly their legs would just spring. And then jump into the water. And it turned out that, like, because the mystery was too hard to unravel, they did th- they did this thing where they ground up the cricket at like different stages, like literally the entire body with the parasite inside of it, and looked at the hormones and the different proteins that were being expressed at different time points, and discovered that right before they jump in, there was some sort of light sensitive protein that was upregulated right before they jumped in. And they realized, and they went back and looked at the data that. They were only jumping in in the wild at a certain time of night. And that time of night was cyclical, and it was about when the moon was up and out. And it turns out they were not jumping into water. They were jumping into the reflection of the moon off of the water. So this this like human concept, this scientific construct of like, oh, they're jumping into water because that's what it appears like to us, completely ignored the subjectivity of the cricket. Let's assume they have it, which is they're, they, they don't care about water. They're jumping into light. And so I, I always think of the, the first thing I thought of was the narcissist myth when I thought about, like, if I would ever write about that cricket. And I think I've given a lecture where I talk about the link between it, right? Like staring into the water and what it means to have, like, this thing reflected back to you, what it means to have the moon reflected back to you. Or yourself reflected Or yourself, back to you. right. Now, was the, you said you were going to get personal and, and you just went so far as saying you didn't look in the mirror. And then was there a second part to that story? Uh, no, just that... that um, it was, I don't know. Have you ever gone like a year without looking in the mirror I, in the no. dark? Like I literally, any time uh, I showered in the dark, I shaved Why, in there the were, dark. Were there mirrors in your shower? Well, in the bathroom. Oh, I, I was a, so basically, I avoided mirrors at all stages and at all costs. Like I avoided the, like looking into the sun. Wow. Like my eyes would be, get burned. And did did this have any effect on you? I think. I mean, that's not like. It's not, you know, it's not like Sean Connery level confidence on some level, right? Like that's, it, it must have an effect. I don't know if it does so now still. Any. Well, it's, it's about like, a, I mean, it's about your own image, right? Yeah. It's about whether or not you get off on your own image or you feel proud of it or you are ashamed of it. I noticed like sometimes I'm, I'm, I think about how low level the narcissism of people who like post constant photos of themselves is because I, I'm amazed that they don't notice how silly they look by being so obvious about their narcissism. 
And I think like if you're truly narcissistic, you would realize you look like an idiot posting yourself all the time and that people are judging you for that. And, and, and you know, I, I think like we're really allergic as a culture to like obvious manifestations of narcissism. I mean, it really bothers us. Look at like the way we see the, like most people see President Trump, for example. Like it looks like insecurity. It looks like, you know, like insensitivity. It looks like all this stuff. And I think like if you were really narcissistic, you would want people to really love you and you would probably behave in a way that was much less narcissistic, but maybe deep down more narcissistic. Right. Well, like, like kind of moths or, or crickets to the light. Um, it attracts, it attracts other narcissists probably. It, no, like, it, like it doesn't turn them off. Oh, other narcissists because they feel like they're like, then they're given permission. Yeah. To they'll be the seen though. Yeah. They'll be seen or they'll come or yeah, it's permissive. That kind of thing. I mean, you know, my relationship with photos, I don't take photos. I don't, and, and in part it's because I don't really like them of me. Like I, I don't, I don't want to be seen. I don't want to see or be seen. And I, I did think that funny thing to pick to do this podcast. Well, no one's going to watch this on YouTube. They're just going to hear my voice. I'm proud of my voice. There's no mirrors. There's no mirrors for vocal cords. How are you listening to this? Are you on Spotify or on your on YouTube or some other medium? I wonder. Um, so, so I, I, I was intrigued by the, a couple of people have asked us to talk about narcissism and one said narcissism and seduction, which I couldn't help, you know, wonder at that juxtaposition. Like, well, did they mean seduction, like using your narcissism to seduce others? Like, is it, is it a thing of like post someone who posts pictures of themselves? I mean, the most obvious manifestation of narcissism these days is Instagram probably, yeah. right? And there's the obvious, like, um, <laughs> I, I have a funny story, hopefully. I mean, I don't mind if it goes back to the person. Just anonymize it. No. So there's a guy named Adrian Grenier. <laughs> There. who's an Perfect. actor for actor from entourage and um i know him so if i'm sorry adrian if you listen to this but um but it was it, it is funny because he posts lots of photos of himself well he's giving me a look like don't do this no 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 just go on i'll tell you after the podcast <laughs> <laughs> he posts a lot of pictures of himself on instagram i think it's all pictures of himself and then when he the few times he doesn't post a picture of himself he posts a drawing of himself that by one of his fans and um so someone, I, I, a friend I asked who, who does always want to remain anonymous with his uh, artwork. I said, would you do something for Bombay Beach the first, uh, the first uh, year that we did the, the festival? And he said, well, I want to make a commentary on the narcissism of Hollywood. And I want to take all these drawings, these usually pretty awful drawings of Adrian Grenier. And I want to blow them up from Instagram and make them really huge. And then make a huge wall and call it the Great Wall of Grenier. And uh, put it in Bombay Beach. <laughs> so he did this, and it's just wonderfully weird. And of course, Adrian Grenier got wind of it, and he posted a picture of it, thinking that it was this honoring him. And uh, well, yeah, there's no way to deflate the the uh, ego of a narcissist, or yeah. like like yeah. yeah, it did. So that's but that's but that's funny. Someone who's so self-aware can be so unself-aware, right? Like it's just like a, wait, but that doesn't mean he's a narcissist. He, I mean, he he's got a he's got an image. He's got a career based on his uh, likeness, like that. So what? How do you go from that to the internal state of actually, you know, in in psychiatry, there's a thing you're never allowed to pathologize someone at a distance, like right. it's a, it's against the rules, you know, it's, right. or it's against the code of ethics. It's right. against the morality of the right. field. So like, how do we know? I mean, you're on Instagram. Everyone on every. People post photos of themselves all the time on Instagram. Yeah, so I, I only don't, I, I can see the temptation of wanting to like, you know, look at yourself and see what do, how do people see me and see how people react. And then they, it does get encouraged. The few times that I've posted a selfie, like you get more likes. So there's like something about the, the, the medium that, that does foster narcissism. But I, the only reason I don't is that I, when I see others do it, I judge them so harshly that I think like I don't want to be thought of in that way. Um, it's not for lack of actual narcissism. It's, I think it's just a slightly more self-aware narcissism. In a way, I think I'm probably even more narcissistic for not posting selfies. Do you ever like, I'm more thinking about my self-image. Do you ever like your own posts? No. Is that gauche? And I don't know these social media Yeah, I rules. think so. I think that's considered a, like, there's certain like, like things that, that, that I think feel like, and again, this is subjective, but I think there's certain things that like just scream desperation. One is like a paragraph full of, of, uh, hashtags. Because people, and then sometimes they just get more and more broad, you know, like 
photo hashtag photograph or Earth, you know fashion Earth. or something and solar like, system you really Milky think people way. are gonna like look for that hashtag and find your post you know and like so that screams desperation to me a little bit and then somebody who just posts endless selfies to me it just looks like they're in despair and and therefore just kind of again superficially narcissistic um so i just would i would encourage people to be more profoundly narcissistic and therefore you know just a little less obvious about it because we all obviously are concerned about how are we perceived right that's yeah. okay i think obviously don't obsess over it but um i i think that it gets into this you can it could probably becomes like an addiction too like the, that that getting people's likes and and then comparing and it probably can devolve very quickly into even deeper despair i imagine for people who just post these constant selfies all right um, i have a question for you that i am fundamentally incapable of answering myself because i know neither of these things well enough how similar or dissimilar is a mirror from instagram like just straight up do you feel sometimes like it's replacing it's replacing the mirror the probably mirror. in many ways it is yeah and in a way it's better than a mirror because you can you know, like a photo of yourself is is more probably what other people see, whereas the mirror, you're kind of locked into like a certain view. That's why it's, you know, if you if you haven't. But but you when you when you look in a mirror before you go out at night, you're 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 summarizing your general aesthetic. You're looking at your style. You're looking at who you like, who you are that evening. And I feel like people I've seen people look at their phones and have like for their version of a page, you know, they have an aesthetic across all the photos. They, they want to maintain like a color tone yeah. or a lifestyle image and, yeah. and it feels like fashion right it's a yeah. kind of fashion it's an abstract digital fashion mm -hmm. and i imagine when when they you know i've seen people just look at the phone just to check out what their page looks like in general which i imagine is very similar to like in a restaurant going in, in the mirror to like look at how your hair is doing yeah no, I, I mean i think that the, we we are growing up we've gotten so used to like every, i think if you had like plopped instagram or even our, our our kind of relationship to the phone and all this even just 20 years back people would be deeply deeply shocked and appalled and i think that we only like are okay with it because it's so general if it was only half the population or 25 percent of the population that was like doing instagram and looking at their phone five hours a day we would be really worried about those people, I think. And we'd probably like get them quickly to rehab or therapy or, you know, some sort of intervention would take place. And the only reason that's not happening is that it's so prevalent and we don't mind picking up our phone. We don't mind other people picking up their phone because it gives us an excuse to pick it up ourselves. I think there's like a mass, mass addiction and a mass, mass, you know, pathological narcissism happening. I used to joke with a friend of mine, uh, David Greenberg, who was the father of a recently departed father of a, of my best friend. And he was, you know, famously self-obsessed and, um, and we would joke that I was a bit self-obsessed too. And I would say, you know, I can be such good friends with David because I'm so self-obsessed that his self-obsession, I don't even notice it because I'm just thinking about myself. And so we can be really good friends because we're not as bothered by each other's like, uh, this is a confession, right? Um, a public confession, right? Deeply narcissistic, probably. Even this well, very endeavor of doing this podcast if we count is our, probably... If we count our 60 listeners as public confession. <laughs> That's why I'm not worried about it. Doesn't worry about until we, until we get famous and people listen to this, it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> That's the guy who doesn't. <laughs> this guy who shaves in the dark. I think, I do think, I think it's a, I think it's a problem I've, I've had that I've been conscious of and probably, you know, and tried to like deal with. I think I was more self-obsessed than I am now. I, I've tried to become more outward looking and more compassionate with, you know, spiritual growth with age. And like, it's something I, I definitely think about. And so I think I, it's a subject that touches me both personally and I think as a culture. And I think we all do well. I think it's more interesting on Instagram when someone has more posts looking outward than inward. It's just more interesting to see the world through their eyes. It's still them. So yeah. I think if people could understand that you can still be self-obsessed and just expand your sense of self, that is helpful. Like, like, let's see how you see the world. That's interesting too, right? Yeah, let's see like your friends, like that's you. It's still you, right? I still, I'm still curious when I see somebody who's good looking, male or female, and just post pictures of themselves, the only it's, it's boring, right? Like, 
be less boring let us see an expanded sense of you and and then uh, and let that you be likable also by virtue of the fact that you're interested in the world and that that's just makes you more profoundly interesting and therefore it's like it's more self-rewarding to like build yourself to be more uh complete than just only interested in this superficial thing of what you look like at that moment right um so i guess i i, I would advocate for like an expansive and enlightened narcissism i guess i would say uh, let's get, i'm just thinking this for the first time so let's cycle back to the how that relates to seduction uh, in a bit but i'm curious like what do you think you look like? Like, how do you know what you look like? Do, are, are, do, do you, when you imagine what you look like in your head, is it a compilation from photos that have been taken of you? Plus, plus, I guess, things I see in the mirror. Plus this image I see now of myself. But like you rarely <laughs> see your whole body at once. You know, yeah. you don't, you don't. No, and I'm always shocked. Like, that's another thing. I do work on myself based on these things. Like I'll see like video of myself. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so like clenched up in my shoulders. I should relax, you know? Yeah. And like... It, it I, I do try and learn from images of myself without, again, trying to like not be obsessed. Right? But is it a small, you know, Instagram <laughs> have stories, right? So like when yeah. you, when you, when you mentally imagine yourself, is it like a series of snapshots? Is it a series of small videos where you're yeah, like turning? Probably. Like, what is it? Yeah, it's that, I think. And it, it's, it's like a series of images that I compile if I, i've never done this exercise but if i try and think of like what do i look like i probably see little videos i see little s flashes of myself in the mirror i see how far photos are of you? myself like how many feet are you from you in the mentally imagined version i think i have just a variety close-ups far away you can, you can zoom in like google maps you can like <laughs> no it's more like it's probably satellite. just like flashes like <laughs> are there other people in your image no or have they all gone away they've all gone away <laughs> 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 doctor am i am i pathologically narcissistic <laughs> no 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 i'm just very curious uh because i like anchor to the most recent photo or vision i've seen of myself uh -huh. so like if 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 um if i you know when i do see myself in a mirror or i do see a photograph of myself that day for that day for about like there's a 24-hour half-life that is what i look like in my oh, head like it, it gets it completely overwrites all pre-existing data on what i think i look like it's this, it's it's very bizarre, and I I don't know yeah. if that just means I, my brain prioritizes the present or or can't, can't like average over time or something like that. Now th let's go to the seduction side because again I find it interesting that the person like who's requested this whoever you are thank you, um, narcissism and seduction, when you are being like just brazenly narcissistic, is it in the service of wanting to seduce and therefore like have more love for yourself like through another and is all seduction a form of narcissism um when we when we out when we just set out to seduce someone you know um which i'm sure we've all had that desire and 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 both succeeded and failed miserably at it depending on so many factors that we could talk about but is it just the, is is the desire to seduce just uh uh, 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 the the seeking out more self affirmation, or is it the desire to connect with somebody in a deep way? Do you or, define yourself by the people around you or by you? I, I I go through phases where I will sometimes define myself by the people that are around me at an immediate time or like in a some temp time window, and I feel like those are the times when I'm most weak when I'm defining myself exclusively by what I'm surrounded by. Versus like who I am in, in, as an individual. And so I do think sometimes I think I have seduced based on what like the kind of Im the kind of appearance I wanted to give off. Uh -huh. Like I wanted to be with that person. I had, a, I had an old friend who she would only date people that her friends liked. And it didn't matter if she liked them. But it was part of a carefully curated image that she was displaying. Uh -huh. This was pre-social media and everything. But it was like so clear that it was based on this deep like whatever the opposite of pride is she was deeply vulnerable and deeply concerned with what people thought of her and so her boyfriend would be like an uh you know half of her image and it was very important to her more so than her own happiness what others thought so this is the definition basically of inauthenticity if we go back to heidegger and being in the world if you look at taylor carmen's little section in uh in the movie taylor is professor of philosophy at barnard one of the leading experts on Heidegger. And he talks about when I asked him about what it is it to be authentic or inauthentic, 
Heidegger has this this uh, notion of the they or the one in the sense like one thinks this and it's like a generalized uh, view of what one is supposed to do versus what we've talked about a lot in the podcast is responding to the particular situation, right? So a person who, and you often see this in like insecure people in you know, younger people and high school kids or something, they're constantly taking a third person view of themselves and they're wondering how they're being seen. And you could see if somebody has this view of themselves that they're always going to try and do what one does in the situation instead of what yeah. is yeah, exactly. appropriate for themselves and probably fail miserably. Mm -hmm. And 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 if you do that in in any domain, it's going to lead to a, a kind of palpable inauthenticity. Mm -hmm. If you see it in music, if you see it in, in behavior, you can you can feel it when someone is being authentically present, responding to the to, to what is happening as themselves, taking a certain risk in that, obviously, because you don't know what's going to come out, right? Right, right? We hope that that's what's happening in this podcast, that we're like, literally, you're you can feel that we're not prepared. And that that actually leads to a certain joy of discovery and and a kind of you can probably feel that background anxiety of like n these people don't know what's going to happen next or what's going to be said next and therefore something real might happen right I, if, I if it was all pre-planned and we were just like reading something nobody would want to listen not even our 10 listeners right <laughs> but i still do feel right now constrained by um some like operational heuristic where i'm trying to do what podcast hosts do yeah, well, like, so i'm still i'm still motivated by a role that i feel like i'm playing from so a third person perspective so heidegger says you can't escape that like you have to you can't just make a comp that we're using language right that's that is what one does and we're using words that one uses in the way that one uses them so there is this background of uh what what constitutes an uh, uh, an intelligible action right so there th that has to be there but then it's on that background and it's again the music example is always what i come back to perhaps it's because i'm a musician but i think it's the most salient in a way and the most obvious like you 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 have to play within the key for example if you're improvising and you don't <laughs> like there are, and there's no rule for why you can you can leave that a little bit and you can but you have to at least have this skillful awareness of what one does you have to pass through what, and maybe that's why teenagers are so obsessively doing what one does because you have to go through that and even the authentic behavior has to have like a deep un you know eventually unconscious understanding of what one does and then based on that be able to depart from it and what, how this works is, I think, one of these mysteries that we could like be thinking about for years and years and talking about. Like, we do have to do what one does on a podcast. I don't think we can do like a, a fifteen-hour podcast or a three-second one. And I think you know, and we we have to have a certain back and forth that we haven't discussed. Like, but we try and achieve probably unconsciously a balance of how much I speak and how much you speak, or how much our guests speak, or something. Right, like that. right. Yeah. We're paying attention to the. Yeah, we're paying attention to the pre-existing rules and some sense. So the, the, the seductive part of narcissism, I do feel, I mean, what I said earlier where that the, the, the like ego first centered self first display is attractive to a certain kind of person, or at least initially. And sometimes apparently because you're not trying to, in, you, you're not letting the room shape you, you're shaping your immediate radius. You're shaping your immediate proximity, right? If you if you're self absorbed if you're and, and a lot of people that's attractive to them and I think it's some it's it's kind of this interesting thing where I think for example um, and I've brought this up a, a few times with you where I find it so funny that you know there's there's only so many places there's only only so many physical places on this on this on this here in Joshua Tree right on your compound on your lot um, and you've kind of photographed all of them. And people, before they come here, if they do come here as guests or they do come here as your friends, they've seen the pre-existing photographs of people on display at certain locations around your property. Uh -huh. And I feel like it's so interesting that people, I, th I feel like they are seduced by those pre-existing photographs and those pre-existing like instantiations of something that has happened and art that has happened and your point of view and, and you having seen other people do this thing where, where when they come here, they want to like, they're almost seduced into recreating that. Right. 
and they're seduced into wanting the the kind of autobiographical picture in their head of them having done that and so i think the you know i'm completely projecting but i when the person said narcissism and seduction i like i really think that they were they were presuming that like there is a kind of appeal and attraction despite the fact that narcissism gets so much shit despite the fact that it's so maligned that it's it's LA this is a image centered this is the image center of the universe right like like it's so entangled in people's behaviors and their their public and personal kind of like outputs that it's hard to like disentangle and it seems to be it's like no longer as much of a pathology like it's going to like some generation is going to own narcissism and maybe it's already happened and the most authentic manifestation will be like the most narcissistic because it'll be most reflective of the age um i remember trying to like put a positive spin on like the new technologies talking to mark rathel my dear friend and philosophy professor and one of the stars of uh of being in the world and i said you know we imagined that you know the, the 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 technology would take us more and more away from human interaction and more and more into these screens and these kind of empty you know uh, experiences but i said look at airbnb airbnb is facilitated by the screen but the beauty of what happens is completely in in real life right and so i use the app becomes transparent, less and less important. And what happens is people appear at the house and we have meaningful, we have me meaningful interactions that have nothing to do with the initial instigator. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and Mark said, yeah, that's one way to look at it. The other way is that everything is so deeply commodified that even your, your life Tao is now for sale and you are like selling the Tao experience uh, that, that, yeah. on the, on the app. And, and it's, and it's because, everything is commodified now right that's what that's where i think with the like people when some like a, a minority a subset of people when they come here they do what they think they're supposed to be doing in a tao lifestyle <laughs> right like they act as if they're supposed to act based on what they've seen and lived before yeah so again this is a kind of perspectival thing i think that you could you can you can look at it cynically or you can look at it you know through rose colored glasses and both are correct and yeah you know, I, I the, you, the I'm pessimist being, and the optimist can both be have, find infinite validation for their viewpoint i don't think it's bad i think it's interesting i think it's yeah. chameleonic in a, in a very fascinating way uh, like i um i think there's a large part again this is from a previous episode i think it's imitation all the way down i think that's what humans are i think that's what mammals are that's how we learn that's how we transfer knowledge and our dependencies generation to generation and so like i see nothing wrong with that i just find it fascinating yeah this this imitative idea but there is i i'm just interested in that place where imitation becomes no longer imitation right, and it becomes right. a, a unique instantiation of the moment and when that happens i mean we talked about it on our on our boat adventure you had said that if i if everything had gone smoothly and according to plan and i'd had everything and we hadn't broken down it would have been an imitative experience in the sense that i would have just been showing you this this tau experience yeah and instead due to both breakdown and our ability to react positively and and beautifully to break down scenarios without instead of despairing because obviously i think one ingredient it's occurs to me now to the authentic reaction is not to be too attached to the predicted outcome yeah absolutely right i mean if you if you want things to go a certain way and, and imagine if we planned our podcast and we're like okay we're going to talk about narcissism for 25 minutes and then we're going to talk about imitation and then we're going to talk about seduction and then i'll be like wait patrick you talked about you know right. seduction you first and you you fucked up our plan and there are people like this right and then yeah. like you go in and have our the interviews and th they have their questions all planned and then if you trying to deviate from that and that's just like there's no greater indicator of someone's lack of expertise right yeah um everything the brain enjoys is violation of expectation we're not rabbits so i i, I think that's the beauty in the world when when the, your predictions go awry right and then how you respond is, a, you is, respond. is, 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 a, is a mark of your character. Mm -hmm. Who is this person? That's when you get to see it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and again, it's the same in, in, in the domain of being a human and in specific domains, whether it's the domain of music or the domain of, you know, gardening or whatever it is, right? Yeah. It's this kind of fine. One of the most beautiful metaphors I ever heard was, um, 
James Hillman was this great anti psychoanalyst who was a, a Jungian uh, a Jungian he studied directly with Jung I think I met him in Italy as a very old man and uh, he said the soul whatever that is we shouldn't think of it as something in us we should think of it as something that we are in and the best metaphor for the soul or the anima I think is what uh, that's the Italian word for it and I think what Jung used uh, is of a garden because it's something that you dwell in and then it's something that is this perfect balance ideally of uh, uh, nature just doing its thing and a certain degree of cultivation and of like of planning and of design but that dialogue with who we are is again it can't be like a building that you just make from the ground up the, exactly how you want it nor should it just be an, a totally untamed jungle that just happens to you so i just think this this metaphor of the guard of this of this of the soul being a garden that we dwell in is a very both beautiful and useful one and so maybe what happens we, if i kill every plant i've ever owned is that what does that you're say fucked. you have no soul <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> no it's I, obviously, I think there's a reason that gardening as an activity is so fulfilling for that very reason, that you are having uh, a, a dialogue with something that pushes back. And this is another big theme in being in the world in the film. But uh, that if, if, if you have ultimate, con if you have too much control, uh, for example, if you're working, if you're a, a carpenter, you want to use a wood that that has its unexpected personality and that you have to react to a grain that you've never seen that exact grain before. You would think like, oh, maybe the particle board would be the best because you could shape it into any shape you want. But no, like if something that gives, that's, or an instrument, imagine that just let you do anything with infinite facility. No, you don't want that. You want the pushback of the instrument and you want to have the resistance. The world, to, if the world resists, the world shows up as meaningful. If the world um, uh, just, complies to your every whim then there's no meaningful differences anymore and therefore everything appears as meaningless and i think that's the problem often with these our phone lives like okay now twitter's boring me let me go to instagram now this person's boring me let me go to the next person and there's no reason to be one uh, the, the 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 concept is called optionalization and i think that's mark uh, rathal's uh, term and he said we have a we have a, an age defined by infinite options and no reason with for, no reason to choose to choose them. one amongst them. Yeah. yeah, so we want to have the world pushing back, and I think and so plants push back in the soul garden. Is that the is that the wrapped? Is that yeah. the bow atop the? Yeah, you can't just that, you can't just like conjure a plant. You have yeah. to you have to you have to do the things that allow it to grow in the right way, and then of course you can trim it and shape it, but you don't mm -hmm. you don't just create your your plant there probably will be an app one day that lets us just like grow whatever you want and then we'll just like look at the world through an infinite you know of infinite possibilities and the question will be how will we find meaning in that world there's a certain kind of tree that grows immediately after a fire or thrives immediately after a fire and uh, i think a morel mushroom as well uh, will be the first thing that appears after if you like burn down a, a forested lot so I, I think my soul garden is full of those those two species i just don't see things that don't move i'm like the t-rex in jurassic park and plants just don't move so they literally just i just don't see them in my consciousness so i can't tend to them it's funny i've been seeing all this hour there's a window with these trees outside and we've been you know dominated by smoke the last three four days and now the wind has come and it's swept the, the window the, the smoke away there's blue skies for the first time in a few days and the trees are just moving like crazy because from the wind and I've been noticing the movement of the trees a lot and you say that yeah. the plants don't move, but of course they do. Fair. They grow and they, and they rustle. I guess I like locomotion. <laughs> locomotion is a more advanced kind of movement. I, I like internally generated movements, not externally generated movements. I do. There's probably like one of those potted live basil plants somewhere in the corner of my soul that I am keeping alive, but like through, through like, um, like just moisture that collects in the air. It's not an active process. Now, as far as seduction, I feel like we can we can go a little deeper in that. I really enjoy. So there are the ways that the technology impoverishes our existence, and then there's ways that I think uh, almost accidentally they, it's it's enriched it. And one way is it, is enriched a word? No, <laughs> enriched. <laughs> it's enriched it. Uh, <laughs> the um, 
we've talked a little bit about this, but so seduction happening through the phone. Uh, I, I, I've come up with a term that I'm proud of called textual chemistry mm -hmm. that I think often coincides with sexual chemistry that we think of like this physical thing. But when you meet somebody, first of all, it's nice now that these apps have been born that allow us to seduce people who actually want to be seduced rather than like the horrible, uncomfortable feeling that women especially must have suffered for centuries um, of being accosted by a man walking down the street or in a bar or I mean, growing That's, up in that Italy. still happens. Now it's just additive. Now they also get harassed over text. I think there are more. It happens less. I think it's less socially acceptable right now to just like go up to somebody and try and pick them up. I think we Don't have think? no idea what it's like to be a woman. That's probably true. That's probably true. I, women, please tell us. Has it gotten better, especially, you know, like in the last 20 years? I, I was thinking it's nice that when you match with somebody on Tinder or, you know, that you get they're opening up a space and saying it's okay yeah. to flirt with me and therefore that obviates the, the the need to like walk down the beach and like like go up to somebody and talk to them and yeah. that was difficult for men too i mean we it's obviously worse for the woman but i growing up in italy in a culture where seduction was so important right and um and and that that skill literally of like being able to go up to somebody cold and 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 charm them and get them to keep wanting wanting to talk to you right and never and not make somebody uncomfortable make them actually want to like spend more time with you god that racked the nerves right like i remember like in high school already like we would like walk down the beach in italy and say okay can we go talk to those girls and they like, just like get so nervous right and then like obviously then in those in those cultures they're they're defense mechanisms grow for telling you to fuck off in ways that uh you know then italians would particularly hone in on americans because they didn't have those skills because american men weren't as aggressive as and was Italian your, men, right? and was your worth as a teenage boy about the reflection of did this work 100 percent. yeah so i mean they, <laughs> functionally they were mirrors at that point they were you know they were reflecting yeah. your ability and capacity they're just kind of like you know we have like smart thermostats now a yeah. person's just a smart mirror yeah. at that point no, absolutely. And of course, you know, if you think, and again, back to the being in the world worldview that like risk is an essential part of meaning, uh, that you need to take the risk. That's when you feel alive. Right. So in a way that, that the apps take away that risk and, you know, you can just like say hello to a thousand people and just hope that one says yes. And there's not real, there isn't that nervousness. Right. And, and partly that nervousness is what builds the skill set, right? Because you know that you have the potential of failing, and if you have the potential of failing, then you you want to do the thing that makes you not fail, and you build your skill set of human interaction. So I do think that there is a beauty in that, but it, the cost is probably not worth it because I think that women have a right not to be picked up in the street. And I'm glad that, in so far as the apps have helped, and we don't know if they have or not, but I think they have a little bit, I'm sure. Um, then then uh, it's good to open up this space that's a little bit safer for everybody involved. Um, and then I do think there is this kind of beautiful nuance that is almost accidental that has been born of like we've talked about, like the temporal, the minute temporal differences of how long somebody takes to answer a message and that feeling it evokes in you and of, of anxiety. If I said the right thing and and I haven't gotten an immediate response, so maybe what I wrote was wrong and uh and all that doubt and then all of a sudden an hour later the response comes and then they did like it and like it's it's this ping-ponging that is you know probably deep down i think essential to being human right like i think yeah. that we, we want that little bit of nervousness and we want that little tingling of like of, of affirmation and again there's a, a line where it becomes you know incapacitating or obsessive but i think there's also a place where it allows for true human connection and that's that's lovely right i, I used to um with the next girlfriend of mine we used to send those filthy james joyce letters about his wife's arse uh back and forth when we knew <laughs> if we you haven't read these look up james joyce's filthy letters to his wife with his the most kinky weird like uh obsessions that he had I, I won't say anything more about it but look them up online and so what we used to do is when we knew the other person was in a car we would send a large chunk of the text knowing that we could get siri to read it out loud so that 
uh, we would do this like shared experience, which is like, okay, you're, you're driving right now. Okay. Here's the thing. And then, then you just, if you were in the car, you'd say Siri, read my text messages. And then Siri would read you this filthy James Joyce thing. And what I really appreciated though, was there was one moment cause we had these, um, like red receipts, read receipts, right. On yeah. iPhones. And it was just like one of these letters. And then at the bottom, it just said like red four twenty six PM. And I just really liked the idea of like the, like if, if, if Joyce first sent that, right, he wouldn't have sent it by letter. He would have sent it probably by text. So it's like if Joyce was alive and married now, he probably would have done it over text and he would have got one of those receipts at the end that his wife had received it. <laughs> and I just find that so appallingly digital. Yeah. And I, it was such a strange thing to see like a James Joyce prose with a, a, with a read receipt at the bottom. Uh, and, I, and I just really liked it imagining the kind of, different kinds of seduction and communication that you can have at this day and age. So, um, so do you enjoy seducing people via text? Oh yeah. I, I think I like by far the most attractive part, the second most attractive part of a person's body, second only to collarbones is definitely their mind. Like I, I am a hundred percent, my entire sexuality and sensuality is based on collarbones. Yeah. Obviously collarbones are first. Uh, <laughs> it's, well, it's the most fragile part of the body. And, um, that that like and and that extended kind of foreplay or getting to know someone or getting to trust someone and playful and also i find like it it's kind of bimodal you have to either be really smart or the other side of the equation the, the, like that's my favorite kind of sexual partner you're either on one side or the other i don't like the average of the bell curve um and so like you get across this abs you, you get someone's intelligence and you 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 play games that reveal themselves next time you see the person I like that it's not it's not just intelligence it's also there's a unique like banter that exists with between two people when it works that you bring out a, the best part of each other and and what emerges is this you know a side of you that you are also discovering yourself through it back to narcissism right but like um i love what emerges when there is that textual chemistry between two people and and that kind of third entity that is your rapport yeah and that happens both physically and it happens digitally and they're both equally exhilarating to me like i get as turned on and as um you know just my heart will can flutter as much from the right text exchange as it can from making out with somebody oh yeah i just absolutely. think that's amazing and it's like it's like this reminder of our just how deep our humanness goes that it can survive this kind of total dehumanization this kind of de uh, what seems completely dephysicalized interaction but it just isn't though like i i would you know during the day when i'm uh, kind of writing i'll put my phone up and i don't see the phone as the phone if someone sends me a text message that person's there yeah they're like superimposed on it. you know i'm oh. waiting for them i'm not i don't give a shit about the phone i don't even see it it's like a I'm peering through the, you know, two cans connected by a wire, just straight into their house or mind or point of view. And so that's what's so attractive and neurotic about it and is like the person. Neurotic or neurotic, you said? It, erotic. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. also neurotic, I think. But yeah, yeah. I heard it, you it, say it, neurotic and it also fit just it, as well. <laughs> it gets neurotic if you can't stop looking at it. But but it's very much it's very much the person that's there. Uh, and I don't know. I, I, I get off on attention. And so like it's also important to me to know that attention, you know, in those moments where you're back and forth, you know, that attention is there. Also. Yeah. It's a, speaking of Instagram and the, the, the nuances that we get so attuned to. And I think as human beings, as we get more skillful at whatever it is, we become more attuned to these minute differences. And so like you look at your story and you see there's some sort of secret algorithm that puts the people that are most paying attention to you those days at the top and you get a little thrill to see that oh that person's paying attention right but isn't it and weird when so you're so nice when your lover's lover is looking at your posts first um hypothetically hypothetically it's i, I mean i think it's it's weird and fascinating and it's a domain to think about um all of these are domains what's nice is that they're domains rich with meaning what what i fear most is a meaningless existence Right. Yeah. And and what can you can start to feel very quickly scrolling through endless Instagram feed or looking at Twitter or whatever it is that we do or looking at the news. You know, Kierkegaard had 
whole essays about how we shouldn't read the what what the, at the, in the late 1800s you didn't have these things you had just the news the press and he talked about the press being uh, a domain of meaninglessness because you couldn't have an effect on it so it was this passive kind of consumption of like world events mm -hmm. and that people who read the newspaper were wasting their lives away right and we have that times a million as we scroll through our phones and feel dehumanized and feel meaningless and feel empty and and then these kind of meaningful experiences start to emerge and again there's a fine line between neurotic and erotic and there's a fine line between compulsive and 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 uh you know just enthralled and uh and and just captivated by someone's attention like I, I don't know where that line is. Obviously, there are people who like get incapacitated by these things, but there is a place with the right balance that I don't know how you achieve it, but there is a place where suddenly this meaningfulness emerges mm -hmm. and you can you can feel in these subtle ways that you are in somebody's heart, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. that, and that and then you have these interactions that are deeply, deeply meaningful. And yeah. that's what we're all looking for. Yeah. What I fear most is a fully predicted life. Yeah, well, that goes hand in hand with like, yeah. because it, it oh, does no. it. The, the world's not pushing back in an unpredictable way. Yeah, and on that note, I apologize, dear listener, for not having um, <clears throat> repeated myself at the beginning of sentences twenty times in the. You didn't course do of this it, right? Podcast. I was wondering. No, not at all. Because well, but you that's got the whole point. So contained into the actual conversation. No, not at all. It's because, as I said it. earlier, the value of the brain, the beauty of the brain, is in violation of expectation. So I set up an expectation, and then it violated it. And all I really wanted was people to pay attention to my sentences, which they probably did more so because I had. But they might have paid attention to the structure instead had, of the content that's ah, fine <laughs> i had i had gamified my own my own speech I, what, I one of my first little documentaries was about a mathematician named raymond smullion if you're looking want to look him up it's uh s and smullion emma's and smullion u's and smullion <laughs> that's how you would spell his name um <laughs> but he said that he got interested in paradoxes when he was about seven years old when his older brother said they used to like play tricks on each other on april fool's day and the, on, on the day before April Fool's, he said, his older brother said to him, tomorrow I'm going to fool you like you've never been fooled before. And so all day he waited to be <clears throat> fooled and his brother didn't do anything. And then he said, you gotcha. didn't fool me. And he said, well, I did, right? Because he thought I was going to fool you. And he said, yes. And then he said, and I didn't, right? And he said, so you were fooled. And he said, that got me thinking for many days about had I been fooled or had I not been fooled? And, and, um, the so, absence of a signal is still a surprise, according to, yeah, according to neurons. So explain that before we sign off. Well, just that the violation of expectation is the absence of the signal, right? Right. If you if you've come to expect a a, a reward after a bell rings, and then it doesn't come, uh, that signal is equally meaningful to the brain. It's it's again, the brain doesn't like the. The, the, the average of the bell curve it likes either ends it likes the extremes it likes the anomalies and it doesn't really matter if it's pro or con or positive negative or signal no signal it just wants to it wants to remember the violation of its predictions yeah and and and, and when you text somebody and they don't text back that's the ultimate absence of a signal that is just as as meaningful as 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 the answer there's a there's a lover who um when we're in person, I do this thing where she kisses my cheek and then I say again, she kisses my cheek again. And I say again, 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 again. And she doesn't stop until I stop. And I tried it over text and it didn't work because there were like these like agonizing half hour delays between me saying again and her response. And it was so interesting, the difference between my absolute, my brain had expected immediate reward, immediate reward, millisecond reward coming. And it just didn't, it just didn't happen. So there's definitely a, there's there's a loss somewhere in the digital ecosystem of love. Well, so if um, if you're still listening right now and you're on YouTube, Me? no, the, who are you talking our, to? Our there's no one else in this room. Who are you talking to? <laughs> no, I was about to sign off, and I was gonna say like I would love to hear people's like experiences in comments about like this um, seductive process yeah. and what works and what doesn't and what do people enjoy and i do think it's it's really interesting how you know how we also have to compete for people's attention now and like uh you know it's obvious that people are getting bombarded with with possibilities yeah. and so what makes one stand out versus another and uh you know how do we keep our interactions like rich 
and meaningful. I'm, I'm very curious about that in this world. So where the, the possibility of meaning is, is, uh, seems to be in some ways always less. Good note to end on maybe until tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs>